Hillsong Exposed, a multi-part docuseries from Discovery Plus has came out this week and I had a chance to watch all three episodes. Diving deep into scandal, corruption, adultery, and much more. Is there any information in this docuseries that we don't already know? Is it totally accurate or is there a smear job happening against Hillsong Global? So on this video, I'll give you guys my thoughts, a recap of the docuseries, which parts I thought were unfair, and one passage that I think this directly parallels in scripture. Bruce Lawn. There was a lot in there that I want to share with you guys, a brief kind of recap summary, and then uh, give you guys a little bit of depth, one passage that I think is going to glue it all together. The parts that I, I thought were, were honestly just unfair uh, and not accurate from just my understanding of things. So off the rip, uh, Hillsong does a phenomenal job of making people feel welcome where they hold you know you belong signs and and so on and so forth and so everybody's welcome they're engaging culture which we're going to talk more about that towards the end and there's just this this desire to make people feel connected make people feel welcomed make people feel engaged and uh like like they're a part and, th and they use that language there they serve people treats while they wait in line to get in so on and so forth so it starts out with this like holy moly this is this is this is cool right and then in the origins of it, you start kind of figuring out where Brian Houston got some of this vision in terms of him going to America, going back to Australia, blowing up Hillsong Church, really on the back of Hillsong Music, which is a whole nother conversation with regards to how they set that up, with regards to some of the publishing things that they didn't even address in this documentary of how some of the musicians were being treated. And that was kind of built on the back of a child pop star named Darlene Zik, I think is how you say her name that made good music and then they just kind of made contemporary pop music but put jesus on it so that was really kind of the thing that like exploded them and then they also added hillsong college which is the game really explored in detail in episode three so there's this desire from hillsong initially to stay current to stay uh with the trends to be engaged with society right but the issue with that is when everything is kind of built out like a business it could get very problematic in how music is being used to make people feel like it's a connection with Jesus when it can really just be emotional manipulation of different chord structures and then language around this entire thing. But it was more or less really set up kind of like a business over a hundred million dollars a year is what they grossed across six different revenue streams. Obviously the church, the concerts, which they were doing the same arenas as all the biggest stars out there, CDs, music, their cinema. I didn't even know they had a cinema department and their conferences. Okay. So from a business monetization standpoint, the ecosystem they built was pretty brilliant. Okay. They called Brian Houston, a spiritual entrepreneur. Never heard that phrase in my entire life. I've heard of kingdom entrepreneurs, heard of Christian entrepreneurs, never heard of spiritual spiritual entrepreneurs. And then it all kind of culminates to them getting to a place where Carl Lentz meets Brian Houston. And from all accounts, it seems like Carl Lentz, Brian Houston, it seems like they have this symbi symbiotic relationship. They benefited from each other. Brian Houston wants to go stateside and was really treating Hillsong more as like a franchise at this point. And Carl Lentz wanted to be a part of that ecosystem. And he was already a charismatic, charming, handsome guy that Brian Houston was like, yo, this could be my way into America and expanding this global vision that he had. So they then launched Hillsong New York, their first uh, United States campus in 2010. And it keeps exploding and growing and getting bigger and bigger. And I'm going to tell you guys the one part I disagreed with in the documentary, and then I'm going to get more into some of the particulars of what this all means and the one passage in just a second. But the one part I would say I, I genuinely disagreed with, a lot of it, the, the narrative is true, the, the origin story is true, their desires and their mission statements, them on camera, right? This is, you can't ignore the receipts. It's them on camera. But the one part that I thought was a bit disingenuous was they positioned Carl Lentz to be this dude that was like exploiting celebrities 
to build Hillsong NYC and that they kind of paraded Justin Bieber around. And I just think they, they gave him too much of this mad villain energy. They compared him to Scientology. Like it was, that part was a little over the top. Even me and my wife were sitting there. I was like, man, this, this is a bit much. Like it's one thing to say, hey, we welcome celebrities, creatives, artists. It's another thing to say that, that he was out there prowling, trying to get celebrities in. I did a little bit of additional research. It appears that Carl Lentz met Justin Bieber from Judah Smith, through Judah Smith. J Justin Bieber, Judah Smith, still tight till this day. I believe a more of an organic thing that happened, right? You, you're gonna attract what you are. If you're a guy that's into basketball and into music and into art and into fashion, you're going to attract people that are similar to that. And we're gonna get into some of the more problematic reasons for that and their tier system here in a second. I think most of what you saw Lentz happening with him running around with celebrities, taking pictures with Kevin Durant, Jay-Z, playing basketball with Drake, all those different things, I think that stuff happened organically because he was just in those circles and he was a charming, charismatic dude that knew how to talk to people, knew how to uh, charm people, knew how to listen to people. And you can make the argument that Lentz was getting groomed by Brian Houston uh, and then was Lentz then doing the grooming with celebrities. I, I think that's, that's, a, that's a bit of a stretch in my opinion. But I want to get into some of the deeper uh, issues that was going on here. And I want to give you guys one passage that I really do feel like glues this whole thing together and one takeaway I have. Some of the tension explored in this docuseries was the lavish lifestyle of pastors while seemingly generating that wealth from donation and tithe money. In the docuseries, they sat down with my buddy Ben from Preachers and Sneakers, and he opened up about his conversation with Carl Lentz. We had Ben on the channel a couple of weeks ago, and here are some of his thoughts in terms of the overlap between capitalism, consumerism, and ministry. Carl was kind enough to reach out pretty early on, and he heard me out, and he we spoke on the phone extensively. The thing that concerns me more than even live in a celebrity lifestyle or anything is the structure of churches now that are not associated with a denomination or something where you have these massive multi-million dollar corporations with several different profit verticals that are run by a pastor couple at the top a husband and a wife that essentially make all the decisions hmm. that disperse all the funds that have pretty much no oversight. I think that's a bigger issue where it's like, we hope that everybody's living above board at that level. But if you have unlimited money and unlimited access to travel and to beautiful people and green rooms and all that kind of stuff, it seems like it would be pretty easy to get sucked into that. I don't have a problem with people making money. I think pastors should be compensated well. That's a hard freaking job. If our church is the way by which we make all of our profit, I think there's something there that I think God cares if we turn his house into a marketplace. But the root of the problem that's explored in the Hillsong docuseries can actually be found right inside the pages of scripture itself. So as I was watching this documentary, there was one part that I was uh, that kept reoccurring with the way Carl Lentz was promoted that made me think of this passage of scripture, okay? And this is straight out of 1 Samuel chapter 8. Samuel was the prophet uh, that God would speak, uh, used to speak through Israel. When Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as Israel's leaders. The name of his firstborn was jo Joel, and the name of his secondborn was Abijah, and they served at Beersheba, but his sons did not follow his ways. Okay, they turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said, uh, they said to him, you are old and your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us such as all the other nations have. So here, Samuel's sons are falling short. They're not able to deliver the guidance and the leadership that Israel is wanting. So the leaders of Israel is like, we want a king. We want to be like the other nations. But when they said, give us a king to lead us, this display, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord and the Lord told him, listen to all the people are saying to you, it's not you that they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. As they have done from the day, I brought them out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods. So they are doing to you. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly and, and let them know what the king who will reign over them will claim as his rights. Samuel told all of these words to the people who were asking him for a king. He said, this 
this is what the king who will reign over you will claim as his rights. He will take your sons and make them serve with his chariots and horses, and they will run in front of his chariot horses. He will assign to be commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties and others to plow his grand and wheat ground and reap his harvest and still others to make weapons of war and make an equipment for chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your field and vineyard and olive groves and give them to his attendants. He will take a tenth of your grain and of your vintage and give it to his officials, your attendants, your male and female servants and the best of your cattle and donkeys. He will take for his own use. He will take a tenth of your flocks and yourselves will become his slaves. When that, when, when that day comes, you will cry out for relief from the king you have chosen, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. Okay, but the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us. Then we will be like all the other nations with the king to lead us and go out before us and fight our battles. When Samuel heard all that, the people said he repeated it before their Lord. The Lord answered, listen to them, give them a king. Then Samuel said to the Israelites, everyone go back to your own town. Now watch what happens in the following chapter. There was a Benjamite, a man of standing, whose name was Kish, son of Abiel, the son of Zeror, the son of Bekaroth, the son of a five of Benjamin. Kish had a son named Saul. As, ha as handsome a young man as could be found anywhere in Israel, he was a head taller than anyone else. And so this story goes on to basically Saul, who's more handsome, who is taller than everybody else, is the one who becomes anointed as king by uh, Samuel for Israel. Now, here's something to think about. What is a king? A king is someone that is of royalty. A king is someone who lives at, uh, on a hierarchy above the commoners, if you will. So a king gets access to what? Certain luxuries. A king can't just have anybody walk up to them. He is insulated. He's protected. A king lives a different lifestyle than the rest of the people and the rest of the servants. A king is going to do all of these different things that kings do that don't always benefit the people. Samuel's trying to warn them about this. And so in our modern day context, what would a king be? Hey, we're not seeing the impact we want in America. We're not seeing the impact we want in society. We're not seeing the impact we want in culture. So you know what? We want, we want our own king. We want our own celebrity. We want our own person that's handsome, that's head and shoulders taller than everybody else. Ah, but when we peel away at his character, his character doesn't really match his charisma. His character doesn't really uh, line up with where his gifting has taken him. And this is a pattern that we've seen with a lot of these sorts of institutions where someone's character isn't where their gifting and their ability is. And so they got them a king. And we all know how the story ended. Saul ends up losing his mind. He isn't a great king in the long term, and eventually David takes him, you know, takes him over. And, and and catch and catch this: the people wanted a king. The people wanted a king, but God was willing to dwell among them. And then the people wanted a king. The king ended up failing, and then they got a shepherd. You see, if you look at that word pastor, the word pastor is shepherd. It's someone that shepherds the flocks. So the, the human heart, Martin Luther said, usually goes to two different defaults. It either defaults to rebellion or it defaults to uh, religion. And sometimes religion can get us into idol worship. That's usually the two different places it goes. We want someone to go before us and represent us and protect us and guide us. And we create this two-tier system in our hearts. And so guys like Carl, Carl Lentz get promoted. Guys who are head and shoulders taller, they're charming, they dress cool, so on and so forth. And so we'll look the other way when he's wearing a $10,000 hoodie. Well, because he's our king. What do you mean? The king works hard. He's a celebrity. He, look at, you don't, you don't understand everything that's on his plate. You don't get it. And that was a lot of the stuff that was coming at my buddy Ben from Preachers and Sneakers. He just started highlighting what these guys were wearing. And so we wanted a king, and that was what Carl Lentz became. He became a king in a face. But when someone becomes a, 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 a king, when they're not, when they really need a shepherd, 
These are the sorts of things that will happen. People will fall short. People will start not behaving accordingly because they get insulated. There's partiality. There's double treatment. Forget, I mean, they were treating the, the celebrities with VIP seatings and all this stuff that was happening. But this is why I've always said a lot of these guys that are blowing up these, 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 these celebrity megachurch pastors, I don't know if they're shepherds. I don't know if they're pastors. I think a lot of these guys are content creators. A lot of these guys are great motivational speakers, right? Carl Lentz, he could just be a great, he could be another motivational speaker, right? He could just talk. But when you start meddling and you start mis mixing ministry, nonprofits, $100 million businesses that you don't really got to pay taxes on, it gets super duper murky. And I will say this. I would say this, the, 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 the root of this is I was thinking about this and a lot of what they were attempting to do was they kept saying they were trying to uh, be current. That was the language they used in terms of their music, in terms of their aesthetic, in terms of fashion. They wanted to be current. But see, the scriptures, when it talks about the children of Israel, who, by the way, had a direct relationship, you know, through Moses or through a prophet, it said that the scripture in the scriptures, it says that the children of Israel will be the head and not the tail. So a lot of times as Christians, we're trying to be current, but in trying to be current, you're really just being the tail. You're keeping up, but you're, you're at the back of the line. You're keeping up, but is that really the same? Like in Christian music, it's like, yeah, Hillsong's all right, but it is kind of the stuff that was hot eight, eight months ago, 10 months ago. And so in an attempt to try and be current, you're the tail and not the head. And in order to be the head, you have to be willing to be different. You have to be willing to look different. You have to be willing to go against the grain. That, 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 so, so there should be a distinguishable difference between us. And I don't mean that the clothes are bad and fashion's bad and music bad. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying so often in these institutions, we see the church trying to keep up and be current with culture instead of being the church and building culture, instead of being cutting edge, instead of doing what it is that we're supposed to do in the way that Jesus told us to do it, we want to be like the world. We want a king. We want somebody else. We want representation. We want to feel cool. We want to feel like we're uh, j just, just a little bit removed from royalty. But see, as Christians, as followers of Jesus, there's only one king. There's only one king, and his name is Jesus. You don't need a king. You need a local church. You need somebody to shepherd you. You don't need a king. The king is Jesus. Right? What did Jesus say? The road to destruction is wide, but the path to life is narrow, right? In, in, in our art, in our worship, in our music, in all of these expressions that we do. Why, why should we be copying the world? Shouldn't we be doing what we're doing and doing it onto the glory of God? And if we do it with excellence, I think the world should be copying us. And historically, catch this, historically, if you've looked at popular music, popular music, the church has always led and it's, it's not, it hasn't copied. If you look at all the way back to the Renaissance, if you look at, shoot, jazz music and soul music and R&B music and rock and roll music, all of that got its start in the black church. It got its start in Christendom, right? That we should be the head and not the tail. And so I think this entire paradigm is backwards. I think, I think trying to be current removes you from being the head and not the tail. And as somebody that's the head, you got to be willing to go out and be on your own and, and, and sometimes fall on your face <laughs> and sometimes go, you know, uh, break through those barriers and be the first one to do it. There's nothing wrong with a church without a massive LED screen and incredible lighting. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with stepping into a church. And you know what? The environment is actually not intended to make you feel extra comfortable with the AC just right and the chairs soft enough. Sometimes it's okay to step into a church and the entire experience is vertical. The way the building is built is vertical. The way the pews are shaped is intended to make you uncomfortable so that you could be thinking about Jesus and not, oh, that's a pretty cool song. I like that one. Oh, what's, what's the pastor wearing there? He looks cool. Oh, well, she, she's doing announcements all that you know there's a lot of girls here this but right church shouldn't be that stop trying to stay current right you shouldn't be looking at the world and ted talks and rock concerts to how we build culture we should be looking to the word of god and we should be looking at what god can do from inside the church not trying to get the church to glean from outside in the world anyway those are my thoughts let me know what y'all think king stream entertainment Bruce Lawn. Hey, let me know what you thought about this video by leaving a comment 
in the comments section. Also check out the links in the description. There's some free resources, including a free how to study the Bible course I put together and a free Master My Habits course I put together with my Christian therapist. Also check out some of these other videos recommended for me and YouTube to you. All right, peace.